Can you make nine figures doing this? Episode number eight, Adam Coffee and I. Adam, 2.46 billion in exit with another $3 billion coming. 58 company acquisition. JT Fox here, nine figure entrepreneur, over 70 companies and brands. The point of this podcast, uh, this show here, whether you're watching on YouTube or on Apple or Spotify is, do you want to do a roll up, take your company, roll them all together and exit? Do you want to put companies together, take a piece off the top, or do you want to scale your business? Adam, how are you? I'm doing good, brother JT. It's been a while. You got hat head Adam again. Yeah, what's going today. on here? I know it's 6 a.m. I'm actually in Austin right now. And in, in a hotel, in a hotel ballroom in Austin, there. So, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm in a weird place today. So I didn't have any reception in my hotel room. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you got your own conference room. Hey, you know, the interesting thing is I'm in this hotel. It's really nice. And it's kind of rebranded. It's right next to the Apple headquarters. Yeah. And there's like... I talked to the guys like I'm the only one walking around the hotel. Like I haven't seen a person since I checked in. And he goes, "What's the occupancy? About twenty percent, because it's kind of like in a residential area off the bean path." Yeah. And uh, so yeah, I'm like the only one. But the, my Wi-Fi, hey, my room. Hey, room hey listen, room. I I I know millions of people have been checking us out on on this. I I have to tell you that my billionaire friend who doesn't want to be public about this, but you know, his staff and people reached out to me yesterday and they were like, Hey dude, man, I've been listening to you and JT. It's been fun. You know, you guys are full, filled with a lot of energy. So you, you know who I'm talking about, but you know, that the, the, his staff was reaching out to me saying, Hey, you know, we're, we're, we, we've been listening to you guys. It's been fun. Yeah, it, it has been fun. It's just, you know, it's 6am now. The last time was 5am. So we do it early as well. So uh, today, we're going to talk about, on the next show, we're going to talk about branding. In this show, we're going to talk about fix it. So let's just assume uh, uh, my company or somebody else is watching their company there, or they want to do this for a living, put companies together. So let's say they're about to make the sort of the acquisition, and now it's day one, okay? I own this company. I, I got to put two or three together as well. And I think unlike a real estate deal, where I guess you have to come in and you have to renovate the the property, the, there's some kind yeah. of a... Yeah, we're going to do that. A company is a little bit different because you're dealing with different cultures. Uh, you don't know who's 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 doing a good job, who's not going to, doing a good job. And and there's also integration, right? How do you like integrate all that? So what's the first thing people need to do? It's like, okay, day one here today, because ultimately you want to streamline the process and fix it. What do you do to fix it? Well, so I'm a turnaround guy. That's kind of where my roots were. So, you know, every time I went into a business, I went in because it wasn't performing well. You know, somebody fired a CEO, said, hey, Adam, it's like, eh, come rescue the, you know, re re rescue this thing. And then once you fix it, get it to grow like it's never grown before. And we'll do a buy and build and we'll make a bunch of money, you know. And, and so fixing something is kind of fundamental. And I'll, I'll tell you, it starts before we buy it. So that's that I think is well, the let me stop you before you continue before you continue, right? So I thought the whole premise of the other show is, is you don't do turnarounds, right? Because what what the interesting part is, I've never paid market value for everything. All of a sudden, you say, JT, buy good companies at a good valuation, because you don't want to spend your time fixing bad ones. Now you're talking about a turnaround. So I'm, now I'm confused. I'm telling you to do as I say, not as I do. I'm a turnaround expert specialist, but I tell entrepreneurs only buy good companies because buying fixer uppers takes too much time and energy. But when people would bring me into, you know, a couple hundred million dollar companies is usually where I started. And then I'd go up to the billion. Um, you know, the, the, the premise for me was I got something, you know, below market value. Adam is my fixer. Come fix the damn thing and then grow it. I, t I want to keep entrepreneurs out of potholes. It, it's a, it's a, it, it's a very, you know, I don't want to call it dangerous. That's not the right word. You know, it, it, but it's it's treacherous. You can fail in a turnaround if you don't know what the hell you're doing. Is, so. it, is it possible you fail because you're spending too much time fixing, you know, whether it's bad culture, bad problems, and you're you're missing the big picture is really like, let's assemble the company to get it to a $4 million EBITDA so we can exit at 32. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the last show, if you guys haven't, please go back to the last show. We've also posted them all on Apple and Spotify so that you can listen. Yeah. Just you and I are trying to help people succeed. And so if people listen to all these episodes, we're stacking the deck in their favor because we're teaching them about the profile of the kinds of businesses that they can be successful with 
that the odds of success are much higher. And we're trying to help the lay person who doesn't have experience doing this avoid potholes. And so I tell people only buy good companies. And the reason is the majority of the wealth creation comes from arbitrage, you know, and, and the arbitrage is created by, and that's the difference between the price we sell at, the multiple we sell a company at, because it's big, versus the price we're acquiring a bunch of small ones because they're small, we pay lower prices, lower multiples. And I'm telling people, it's hard enough to do what you just asked me about, which was the cultures and the integrations. It's hard enough to do that with good companies. I'm trying to help people avoid the potholes and not make mistakes. And so that's why we're telling them, don't buy fixer uppers. Let arbitrage, which is naturally occurring, be the vehicle that's going to deliver, call it the wealth creation that we're trying to help people achieve. So, so, so what do they do the first step when you go into a company? Let's say let's say we have a million dollar company, EBITDA, right? Yeah. And then take a company maybe that's doing $500,000 in EBITDA, $500,000 in profits, right? Yeah, uh, I'll, in give you my, I'll give you my secret hacks. So first of all, if I own a business, um, you know, and I'm buying a second business, you know, that's a little different than I don't own a business and I'm buying my first. But if I own one and I'm buying one while I'm in diligence, which means I, I've, I've got a willing seller, I'm a willing buyer. We have an agreed upon price. We've created a letter of intent. And now I've got like 60 days to do diligence and I'm working on my financing and contracts and all that. It's during that period where the buyer of the business needs to take a really good look under the hood of the company that they're buying. They need to, to also have a very good understanding of the company that they already own if they own one. And we're looking at the company side by side before we buy it. And we're looking at it kind of department by department. And we're, we're you know, so each department, accounting, finance, you know, in accounting, I've got accounts payable, accounts receivable, there may be payroll, you know, all of these different things. And I, I think of tasks as being a list, you know, and then I think of time as being on the horizontal axis. And I want to build this thing that's called a Gantt chart. And so a Gantt chart is a project planner. And I'm thinking about things and I'm trying to, first of all, segregate all of these things into buckets. So as I'm going through department by department and I'm comparing how the company I'm buying does things with the company that I own and how they do things, I'm looking for the differences. And then I'm looking for what are the activities that are going to have to happen for me to successfully integrate this business. Let me give you an example. Most companies are bought using an asset deal, which means I'm not buying the stock of the existing company. I'm creating, you know, I have a company or I'm creating a holding company and I'm buying the assets and putting them up into my company or a holding company that, that that's my legal structure. The reason I want to buy assets as a buyer is because I don't own the trailing liabilities that the former owner may have had, you know, and I could tell you horror stories about trailing liabilities and people not knowing. I bought a company and in 1960, it had a gas station out back. You know, it owned its own gas pumps to service its trucks and give gas to its trucks. And then 40 years later, after I bought it using a stock deal, you know, all of a sudden the government shows up knocking on my door talking about some super fun cleanup site. You know, so we don't want trailing liabilities. If we're a buyer, we typically want to do assets. There is a time to do a stock deal. If I have a bunch of contracts with clients and those contracts are cancelable or not assignable, then I could lose all the revenue that I'm buying. In that case, I might want to do a stock deal so that those contracts remain intact as they come over to me. So there is a, a time and place for both. But I, I want to look at all of these things. And then I got to think about like, here's a classic example of a mistake a person could make on an integration. So I do an asset deal and I buy a company. Well, guess what? I can't buy people. So on day one, my new company that just bought all the assets of this other company has no employees. I have to literally have a job offer and hire and do new hire paperwork for all the employees that were in the company I just bought because they're no longer employed. You know, they're not employed by my new company until I do the paperwork. So on day one, I have to have HR people there or I've got to have this covered. You know, however I do HR, I got to make sure I'm giving job offers. I got to make sure I get people into my payroll system. If I buy a company on a Monday and Friday is payday, I got to make sure I got a bank account set up that I got money in that bank account and that I can pay employees. Or 
at least I need to know that this is an issue. And then as a part of the contracting process, I'm talking to the seller of the company and we're creating this thing that's known as a transition services agreement. So we're going to agree that we're going to work together to make sure employees get paid, make sure their benefits don't get cut off in one place before they're turned on in another. And we're going to collaborate. So we do a transition services agreement to make sure you know stuff doesn't fall through the cracks. But but literally, it's like a typical company that that I would buy in the diligence period is when I'm planning for the integration. And, and as the company is bought, I now have all the things that need to be done. Some don't need to be done on day one. Others do. So all these departments, here's the activities on the Gantt chart that needed to happen on day one. Do I have them all set up? Do people own it? Is it going to happen? Yes. Good. This thing may happen you know, three months in, or I got to get it done in six months, but there's no real rush. And so I lay all this out on a project planner, you know, and that helps me because here's the biggest problem. When I buy a company, most employees are nervous. So a person that's like, hey, you know, the, 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 the former owner tells all their employees, you know, I'd like to introduce you to the new owner. I sold the company last night at midnight and they're freaked out. You know, they're nervous. Do I have a job? Am I going to get laid off? Who the hell is this new person? What's my life going to look like? And so we need to be a calming force. You know, hey, everybody, calm down. Love this company. And you're what makes that company tick, you know. And let me tell you about who I am. What's my messaging up front? And, and I, I could probably in a few minutes pop up a video of me welcoming a company after I bought it. And so, you know, because I was buying a lot of companies that are all over the place, you know, it's like I, I would have a team on the ground day one to talk to employees and I do a video. I'd usually come a little bit later because I, I just want them to calm down. Life is not going to change. Go back to work. So I'd send them a funny video. I'd do stupid stuff and make them comfortable and welcome them to the family. So a lot of planning has to go in place. And unfortunately, this is probably one area where a lot of entrepreneurs fall woefully short is they don't plan for the day one and forward. And that's where it starts to go south is when I haven't planned. Even when you plan, you're going to discover that stuff falls through the cracks. And so you'll get better at this with repetition. So first time out, eh, you know, I didn't think of this, this, and this. Second time out, I remembered those three, but now three new ones popped up. But you get better. You really do. And the process of management, uh, you know, the idea there's two options people do. You can just buy the company outright and then consolidation, but under the sort of the quick kind of consolidation of company to increase the EBITDA to exit it, we ultimately want to own 70% and have the owner own 30%. Explain to the people out there. So now the owner is still involved. They got skin in the game. But how much does ego play in factor? Because we have a bigger picture. We want to get to the 4 million or 10 million EBITDA. We're looking for the you know 30 million, 100 million dollar exit. And you have this person like, I've always done it this way. So how do you combine the culture of we, people that are watching this, and by the way, if you're enjoying this or you want to learn more about this or you want to do it together, go to adamcoffee.com. The link is in there. And please do me a favor, share, like, and subscribe to this. The more you do it, the more we're going to do it. If you stop doing it and it takes two seconds, then we're just not going to do it anymore because we're going to think you're not interested. But the ego of the owner, especially like, I've been doing this for 25 years and you want, like, man, we have fresh ideas and new ideas. What advice would you have for people listening there dealing with that? Because ultimately, if we want to do something quick, we we want to keep the owner involved. You know, and there's some cases in businesses where you just get rid of the owner and you take over everything. But if we're doing a roll up, especially with a two, three year or 10 million, maybe a five year plan, we want them in the game. How do you deal with that ego? This is a, a really good question. So uh, when I'm hunting for companies to buy. You know, you and I are, are are working on some bookkeeping, you know, companies. There's 1.8 million of them in the United States. And so before I even go looking at them, I create what I call as an avatar. What is the perfect acquisition going to look like? What's the revenue? What's the earnings? You know, what's the customer verticals it's servicing? You know, and so I'll, I'll kind of profile out what kind of company am I looking for? out of this 1.8 million, because they're not all going to be good, you know, and the, and so and every time I do an avatar, you're going to find that when I want the entrepreneur to stay, that culture of the company is on that list. And attitude and personality of the founder is on that list. And 
JT, I, I'll tell you, I have had times where I found great companies where I thought, boy, this company checks all my boxes. I really like it. And then I get to the cowboy entrepreneur. I remember one guy in South Texas here, and, and it's just like, I'm God's gift by God to, to, to this industry. I got my $8 million company and ain't nobody going to tell me shit. And I'm thinking to myself, I got to put 23 entrepreneurs together who've never had a boss before. I'm going to make them all rich by giving them a wheelbarrow full of gold. And then I have to get them all to sing Kumbaya around the fire and do what I want them to do going forward. And so this guy ain't going to fit. And he's going to ruin my stable, you know, of thoroughbreds and people who will, you know, take direction from somebody who's been successful doing this and built really big ass companies, you know. And so, you know, when I detect that personality, no matter how good the company is, I walk away because that alone could derail my effort. And when you encounter that, that, that cowboy entrepreneur or, or lady and you, you think, I can't, you know, this person's ego is so giant. There's no way I'm going to be able to keep them in a box. And now they're rich and it's like, they're, they're just not going to play ball. Walk away. These aren't the droids you're looking for. It's like, that's the best answer. So I, I, I try to be upfront with people and I, I, I'm very transparent. And so I talk to them, listen, here's the game. Here's what I'm doing. You know, and I, 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 try to make sure that I can detect personality anomalies. And so here, here's kind of the, the, the thing I'll tell you. When we're negotiating price and negotiating contracts, entrepreneur, this is like dating. Right. So the company we're buying, the entrepreneur wants our money. And so they're being on their best behavior. It's kind of like an arranged marriage. And then after the marriage is, is consummated, it's like now you find out who the real person is. And usually during negotiations, there will be times where we're negotiating contracts, talking about price. There will be times where the mask that they're hiding behind, will, will I'll, I'll get a peek at the real person. And I'm like, damn, that guy was kind of an ass. And then he's back to being nice. And, you know, the ass keeps poking out behind the mask when we get into these little issues with contracts, which invariably happen, you know, and we can see how people negotiate and deal with adversity. Be on the lookout for that because you may not detect normally because they're acting on their best best Sunday church behavior because they want your money, you know, and they're trying to be nice. But somewhere in that process of the contracts and negotiating, you know, and the transition services agreement, you're going to see the real person peeking out from behind the mask. If you detect ass, rely on your instincts and and run. So personality is is really important. So if, if I think of the last company, I bought 23 companies. I, I'm really good at reading people and finding the people peeking from behind the mask. And I can honestly tell you that I had 23 great entrepreneurs who, who, although they had their own finicky ways, that's why I call them thoroughbreds. They're thoroughbred racehorses who've been successful. I could corral them. And I tell people, one of my superpowers is I'm a den mother. Because I can get 23 entrepreneurs who've never had a boss to work together for a common cause. And so you can do this, but you have to be good at reading people, reading personalities. And when you detect that there's a problem, trust your gut, trust your instinct. Try to flush that out more, maybe even create a little adversity in negotiation and try to get a chance to take a look at that person. And if you detect it's not going to work, don't go down that path. You know, trust your gut. You know, it's interesting. You, uh, I was working on a, a deal with a plumbing company and I think you make a couple million dollars in EBITDA I'm trying to work something. And they're like, we don't want to do that. We've been around like 80 years and the emotionality to my father started this. I yeah. feel that sometimes people are, are very emotional. Like this is a legacy. A plumbing company is not your legacy, my brother. Your legacy is you walking away with $125 million and you could do whatever you want thereafter too as well. It is the problem with a lot of businesses on that emotional attachment. You uh, once told me something that's true and it stuck with me. You, you you walked in and you said, every one of my problems has a first name and a last name. You know, personality is big. We don't do business with companies. We do business with people. Well, I, I think the, the, the interesting part of you and I is that uh, our initial goal is I have a lot of companies and, and you have a lot of things going on. And at first, the the notion of us was just, okay, 
you guys bring companies, we'll work with you. Adam has a Rolodex, 6,000 private equities. He knows what's going to happen. And then, you know, I was going to marketing and the branding, the sales, the relationship, funding. And, and it was kind of all kind of like set up. And then we were waiting for the business owner to say, hey, send those financials. Oh, I'll get to it. And we're just like, like just yeah. whirling our twums. And I remember the conversation because I think you and I, at first, we were saying we both don't want to get into the trench. We both have a very high net worth we don't want to get into the trenches, right? So I was like, you know, because I think it's, I think a lot of people are, are here and they're looking for their, you know, their eight figure payday, nine figure payday, both of which we've, we've done. So, so there wasn't that kind of motivation. And then it was just like, let's just do it ourselves. Yeah. If I go back in the trenches, I can't help people. Right. And so but, but the point I, is I, going back into the trenches, the amount of time we're trying to chase people or having meetings every week, about the things that they should have had the week before. And I'm like, let's just do it ourselves. And, and and now literally, you know, we both can acquire 50 to 100 companies, which is ultimately what we're going to do. And uh, maybe we do it for people that are here. Uh, anybody who has an accounting company or bookkeeping or service company or think you're a good candidate or want to do it with us or, or sell it to us or, you know, just go in and in, in the link below and very interested in having those conversations. But, uh, you know, where is that fine line, Adam, when we're dealing with, you know, the sort of streamlining process, right? Like, do we need to keep their accounting department because, you know, yeah. and, and you probably have to a little bit on that one because they know where all the bodies are buried, right? So you don't want to be situation, let them all go. And they're like, what's this? What is this invoice, right? Um, but there may be some duplication because the idea is to streamline to profitability as well. Um, yeah, I, th I think the key when, when if we're going to put four or five companies together to get to four or $5 million of EBITDA and exit, or we're putting eight or nine together, trying to get to 10 million in, in, in exit. When we buy the first, you know, my avatar again, for that first company, I'm probably seeking something that's a little bit bigger that has some process stability that, that, that has, you know, has a back office, has a scalable platform to some degree. You know, if I start with something that's too small, then they don't have any sophistication. I buy something else that's too small. I can't, there's not much to work with. I, I call it clay. I need enough clay on the wheel in order to kind of start shaping what I'm building. And so I might seek out on that first company, you know, on that four or $5 million journey, I may buy companies, you know, and I, different sizes, but that first one, boy, it sure would be nice to buy something that has a million dollars in EBITDA, even a million and a half. If I could get just something a little bit bigger, it's got a little bit more process in place. It's got more people in place for the back office. And then I can use that as the platform. And then maybe the second, third one, now I'm changing. I'm buying companies from 65, 70 year olds who are retiring, which is happening every day now. And I'm really just kind of like buying books of business that I'm melding together. I don't need that entrepreneur to stay necessarily, but depending on the industry, I may want them to stay. So as I'm, I'm, I'm scripting all of this out before I ever start, here's the crystal ball. Here's what I need. Here's what it's going to look like. We build a model and then we build the avatars and then we go hunt, you know, and, and hunting, you know, is a process in and of itself. But, but as we, as we're putting this picture together, if I get a couple companies, you know, I don't need two customer service departments, you know, in the same industry, in the same kind of geography. So something else about, about doing a, a buy and build or a roll up, you know, I, I was talking to an entrepreneur the other day and we were trying to convince him to join, you know, a buy and build that I was doing with a, a family office. And, you know, this, this person had that personality problem that we just discussed you know, and they also had no concept. It's like, okay, well, I have an LOI and I'm in Texas and I was going to buy one in Wyoming, you know, or someplace. And it's like, and I'm like, that makes no sense at all. You know, I, I already know in my head, this guy doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. He thinks he doesn't need us. And I'm thinking, I don't need the cowboy who has no idea what the hell he's doing. It's like, I want to collect companies in a tight geographic area. I want to build a region before I worry about building a national or multi-regional company. So where I hunt matters. But when I get a couple of companies now, I should be able to take a look at and map out, not on day one, you know, but I'm planning for it pre-close. And I'm planning over, you know, what do I have to do first day to make sure the train stays on the tracks? But then I got the next four to six months. How am I going to optimize the two companies I've got, you know, if I Three buy things. better, faster, more efficient, everybody. So how do I make yeah. this better? 
how to make this faster, how to make it more efficient, better, faster, more efficient. Those three things constantly have to go inside your brain. You have to think about the buyer because the buyer is not just buying a collection of companies. They, they want an integrated platform. You know, you bought four or five companies. And if you just kind of say, well, here's my four or five companies, you'll make some money, I promise you. But you'll make more money if those four or five companies are integrated. They're, we've maximized the back office cost and potential. So we've harnessed some synergies and, and then we've grown it organically. And so by, by doing that, what we're demonstrating is, as I'm buying companies and growing them, Revenue's doing this, expenses are doing this. So they're going up, but they're going up at a slower poor, you know, rate than revenue is because the, the back office as I harness synergies and I, I build my platform out, they can handle more volume. Most small companies, you know, can, you know, they have a back office that's inefficient because they don't have the scale. As I put the revenue together, I've got, I've got scale now and I should become more efficient in how I operate the business that has more scale. And so that's what lets me actually increase earnings by putting companies together and then making them more efficient from a back office perspective and then cross-selling customers, you know, making strategic pivots, adding new products and services. You know, I, I've been working with a lot of roofing companies lately. And so in that industry, a lot of guys just put out one bid and I'm teaching them good, better, best. You know, we need multiple quotes not just one quote here's the cheapest ass roof i can do but hey who the hell puts up a new roof and then puts old gutters back on let me put new gutters on here while i'm doing a new roof and hey instead of a ridge vent let's uh you know let, let, let's put in a solar powered attic fan and new gutters on my new roof you know so it's it's all about the art of the cross sell and the upsells and would you like fries with that you know, so I'm teaching companies how to grow faster organically, add new revenue streams. And when we put these companies together, we have to harness the back office and make it more efficient. And if we can do that, then what we wind up with in the end is not a collection of four or five companies. We end up with one company that's more efficient than the four individual companies that used to exist. And that's very attractive to the buyer. Last question before we go on, Big A, if you're enjoying this, please uh, like and subscribe if you're on YouTube. If you're on, on the podcast, please give it a, a rating. I guess the more you share, uh, the more we'll continue doing this. Obviously, if we do this at 5, 6 in the morning, because that's the only time uh, that we can normally fit it in our schedule. Ironically, you know, Adam and I are completely swamped doing the thing that we're talking about here and then once in a while helping people. And if you want to do it with us or you want to pitch us or you want to learn more about this, the Adam Coffee um, you know, dot com, uh, and the link is in the chat. Please give it a comment. What do you think? Um, so, you know, I remember you and I, when I first talked to you, you're like, you know, if you are a plumbing company, you should just do all plumbing. And if you're an electrical, you should do all electrical. And if you're HVAC, you should do uh, HVAC. So on my way to the airport yesterday, um, it kind of hit me. Two of the biggest companies in my area, uh, of plumbing HVAC, they say plumbing, electrical, HVAC. Uh, plumbing, electrical, HVAC, or they call it heating and cooling. Uh, why is it, that, does that hurt their valuation for them to exit the company? Because of, or there is a P out there who will take, who will want companies that offer three services. It does make logical sense, right? Hey, you got a plumbing issue, will come, you have an HVAC, like all integrated. But you always said to me, you should probably just stay in the lane and not like separate these these sort of yeah it, you know I, I i'm a anal retentive control freak engineer guy who wants everything neatly packaged in its boxes so what you're talking about in that case this is called the mechanical trades and they they when someone says you know my mechanical contractor they may be referring to plumbing hvac electrical maybe three separate companies could be one i often see plumbing with hvac um it's rare to see plumbing and HVAC also mixed in with electrical, and it's rare to see plumbing and electrical. You know, it, it's just not as common. And so, the the there, you know, can I get away with it and put all three together? Sure, I can. But think about the guys in the truck. An HVAC technician is different from a plumber. Is different from an electrician. These are three distinctly different trades. And so, you'll find, you know, in cities, you'll find that you've got. A lot of companies in each of these specific trades. And so the, while you can do this, JT, and because there's always a buyer out there for something, the, the, the real issue is that people who are out there, you know, that are rolling up 
you know, uh, an industry in, in PE. So let's say I'm buying electricians and there's tens of thousands of electrical contractors out there who don't do plumbing, who don't do HVAC. So if I'm building and amassing, you know, a multi hundred million dollar plus revenue business or 300 million, whatever, that's filled with a bunch of electrical contractors. When I come across the unicorn that's got both, you know, of these trades, they got plumbing with electrical and HVAC. I say to myself, you know what? I'm buying electrical companies. This guy's got 10 million in revenue, but it's 3 million here, 3 million there. It's 3 million here. And I don't want the other two. I just wanted the electrical because I'm rolling up electricians and electrical contractors. So if I take electrical contracting companies as a whole, you know, let's say there's 40,000 of them. I bet the vast majority just do electrical. There's a small subset that do multiple trades. Those aren't as attractive to a-, a, 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 There's a there, there, there is a market, but you're shrinking your ability to sell on- You're shrinking your, your interested, you know, I'll call it population of potential buyers. So I can, I can do it. I can get away with it. I can build a nice business. I call it JT, entrepreneurial schizophrenia. So entrepreneur is so distracted doing so many different things or doing none of them well, you know. So what I would tell that entrepreneur is own three companies, one in each trades with a common holding company that's, you know, Sam's Home Services. And I got Sam's Plumbing, Sam's HVAC and Sam's Electrical. And when I build a relationship with a GC, I bring three different trucks to my job site. But if I want to exit, I could exit independently each of these companies or collectively now i'm i'm attractive to every buyer even the buyer who wants multiple trades says i can buy them all or the guy who wants one trade i could sell one of my three companies so i think it's about organization and when i mix the three together i'm limiting the buyer universe that's out there great point and by the way though this is a wrap for this show again uh you can re-listen episode one to seven either on youtube or uh, go to JT Fox 2X and you can search it on Spotify and uh, Apple as well. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. At the end of the day, we want to do this or show you how to do it or do it together or, or, or invest together, whatever it is. We don't know what it is, but if you just show up and you're in it to win it, we're interested as well. But as long as you guys keep sharing, commenting, and liking, we will keep doing this. On our next show, we're going to talk about the branding component. Which one do you keep? What you should do? Uh, how to go in and brand, which is the problem with a lot of these companies. They've never scaled because they have lack of branding. Uh, so thank you so much, Adam. We will go on to the next show and we'll be wearing the same clothes because we're doing two one in one hour like we've been doing. Because we're efficient. Oh, yeah, so, <laughs> so Adam will change his hat on the next episode. There you go. And um, I'm broke now, so I'm going to wear the same shirt uh, that I got as well. So uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Uh, thanks for everybody for listening. Appreciate all the wonderful comments.